Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, welcome again in this new meeting of Egyptian Society of Tephrology and Transplantation. CME chapter meetings uh, on a usual time and uh, date in Wednesday, 9 p.m. Cairo time. And today we are uh, in time with the, one of the clinical pathological meetings, one of our clinical pathological meetings. We are honored today to have two great speakers. First is Dr. Tari Ashur from Cleveland Clinic, USA. And the second is Professor Usam Ismail, the head of the pathology department, Peniswick University, and the past chair of uh, ISN Renal Pathology Working Group. Uh, before I start, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Mawatasim Al Sayyid, our coordinator today, for all his work regarding this session and all his work regarding CME chapter. Welcome our moderator today, Professor Ahmed al Qurayi, Head of Nephrology Department, Alexandria University. Professor Ahmed is one of the ESNT board members. He is interested in glomerulonephritis and genetic kidney diseases and kidney transplantation, and is known by many applications regarding these issues. We are pleasured now to have two great model speakers and our great moderator, and welcome our all attending professors in this session. And we can expect heavy talks and very heavy discussion after that. So, please, Professor Ahmed, I will leave the floor to you to introduce Dr. Tari and further introduce Professor Hussain. Thank you again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor Yasser, for your uh, kind introduction. And uh, really, it's a great honor to have uh, those eminent speakers tonight with us, and as well as the very interesting and challenging and face-changing subject. It's really a very great challenge nowadays in our understanding and changing of our understanding to systemic amyloidosis with the two pioneers that we have today or tonight. Uh, I'm really privileged to introduce uh, Dr. Tariq Ashur at the start. Uh, Tariq Ashur is uh, an Egyptian a citizen who uh, flew to the USA where he became one of the stars at the Glickman Tower in Cleveland Clinic in the uh, kidney uh, uh, subspeciality. And he is, uh, mashallah, uh, have been uh, accredited uh, many uh, uh, prizes and uh, grants and notifications of honor and the choices of being uh, best president and being uh, best presenter and being uh, one of the great researcher over there. He had uh, many, many uh, uh, abstracts as well as local and national and international uh, lectures and uh, some publications in the field of uh, nephrology. He is uh, very active in teaching and in uh, presenting, and uh, we we hence um, uh, anticipate a very active uh, night and a very great discussion with the attendees. Uh, I, we have uh, great professors and colleagues as well as well attending to this uh, very challenging subject again. Uh, so, without further ado. We're going to introduce uh, Professor Tariq Ashur to start uh, his overview of systemic amyloidosis and then going uh, again back to introduce with Sam, our dear colleague, for the uh, pathological phase of amyloidosis as well. Professor Tariq, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, thanks the, thank the audience and a special thanks to Dr. Yasser who introduced me to the meeting. Of course, to Dr. Wissam as well for uh, accepting, sharing her great experience in that field. So uh, tonight I'll talk about systemic amyloidosis. Uh, is the screen moving? Yes. So the outline is first uh, approach to patients with suspected systemic amyloidosis, which I think uh, uh, all the physicians should uh, be familiar with that approach, no matter what speciality, this is a multi-systemic disease. 
And then renal involvement in amyloidosis, which is uh, our area of interest, uh, management of AL amyloid, which is always multidisciplinary approach. Uh, it's mainly managed by hematologists, but I think uh, uh, all the subspecialities should uh, contribute to the management as well. So as we all know, it's a group of diseases in which proteins uh, deposit extracellularly in tissues as insoluble fibrils. So some sort of misfolding event happened to a precursor protein, and then it precipitates as insoluble fibril, uh, and uh, it will precipitate on the uh, organs, cause organ dysfunction. The fibril will be in part the misfolded precursor protein, but also uh, uh, glucose amino, amino, -glyc amino glycans and um, uh, serum protein, uh, uh, serum amyloid P, which uh, makes the, uh, the, that complex uh, resistant to proteolysis. Now, the, the toxicity can happen from the deposition itself, or for example, in the AL amyloid from the nature of the precursor and the load of the precursor protein as well. So types of amyloid also, as we all know, is systemic uh, where the protein is produced from one site and then it will deposit in a distant site versus localized amyloidosis where both uh, production and deposition happen in the same site. So localized amyloidosis, in brief, very uh, benign situation. It, it, uh, uh, it has common sites like the bladder and the lung uh, present with local symptoms. For example, the patient might present with hematuria uh, and then the treatment will be uh, removal of the amyloid mass, basically, just local uh, surgical removal. I think the uh, challenge will be uh, to decide whether this is localized and systemic. So I think if, if that's not clear, probably that will warrant referral to uh, uh, amyloid center for uh, working the patient up. But otherwise, if it's localized, it's usually self-limited situation. Uh, up till now, there are more than 36 known amyloidogenic proteins in humans. And based on the type of the protein, that will determine the clinical phenotype, prognosis, and treatment. A pathogenic mechanism, uh, whether excess protein production like uh, serum amyloid A and AA amyloid, where uh, chronic uh, inflammation will lead that the liver will produce a lot of serum amyloid A, end up uh, uh, with amyloid deposits versus mutated protein uh, like uh, AL uh, where the uh, light chains are mutated or the hereditary uh, ATTR where the tranthyretin is mutated as well and that will have a misfolding event that will lead to precipitation as well. Uh, the, the, the third uh, way is intrinsic tendency for normal protein to form amyloid like the wild type tranthyretin uh, amyloid which so far, we are not sure what is the mechanism for that, but probably that can happen with aging. So the classification, there are prob I'm sure there are multiple ways to classify this, but I try to, at least for myself, I try, try to make it uh, clinically feasible. So uh, I think about it, common types AL versus AA. And then hereditary types, which is not common. However, the tranthyretin, actually, we have been diagnosing more and more with that. It mainly affects the heart and nerves, to some extent, the kidney, but the number of cases are rising, actually, the hereditary and the wild type. Uh, talking back, uh, back to the hereditary, other hereditary types, like uh, types that will mainly affect the kidney, like apolipoprotein A, uh, the uh, lysozyme, and the fibrinogen A alpha chain. And then others, you know, the uh, ATTR, the wild type, uh, which also uh, there is an increase in the cases, lect, leukocyte, chemotactic factor 2, which also uh, uh, the cases are increasing. And the beta 2 microglobulin amyloid, on the other hand, is the cases are decreasing with the use of uh, high flux dialyzers. So this is a data from United Kingdom National Amyloidosis. Uh, center where, uh, as we can see, the cases of the amyloidosis are increasing. Of course, the AL uh, is the most common there. And then, uh, as you notice, the, those gray bars, those are the ATTR. As I mentioned, you know, the cases are uh, increasing now with the new uh, diagnostic techniques and the more awareness by the cardiologist about that, uh, that disease. Uh, and uh, as we all know, the AA is not common there. Um, so that's why uh, 
this is uh, probably the third common uh, there now. I'm talking about generally in uh, the uh, amyloidosis, not, not specifically renal amyloid. So uh, coming back to renal amyloidosis, in the United States, AL is the most common cause, uh, 81 to 86%, followed by the AA amyloid, and then the ALECT. Uh, certainly, it's probably more common in the South America. Uh, and then the hereditary, uh, I mean, the thousand, Southern American, and then the hereditary renal amyloidosis uh, after that. Because the ALECT is more common in the Mexican population. Uh, presentation uh, depends where the, the amyloid will deposit. It can deposit anywhere from the glomerulus, vascular, uh, tubular, interstitial. Uh, AL and AA certainly commonly um, precipitated in the glomerulus. Uh, so mostly more than half of the patient will present with nephrotic range proteinuria. Other types like the lect, which more deposits in the interstitium can have different phenotypes, uh, anywhere from chronic, chronic progressive kidney dysfunction, uh, mild proteinuria. It's really hard to uh, predict that disease. Uh, uh, I think those are the findings that, those are the biopsies that we will uh, order them and we will have this incident as an incidental. We wouldn't really predict that uh, disease. Um, and the APOA, uh, I think it's also uh, more on the interstitial, more in the medullary component. And uh, that's why also it's hard to predict it based on the clinical presentation. Uh, we should be also familiar with the cardiac amyloid presentation because it's not uncommon to see in our clinic that type of patient that present with CHF exacerbation and then labeled as non-ischemic cardiomyopathy without a clear Cause. Now, you look on the echo, you find preserved ejection fraction, some other echo findings that I will talk about, possibly low voltage EKG, however, that's uh, typically an advanced uh, cardiac amyloid, orthostatic hypotension, poor tolerance to ACE inhibitors. So those all, all those might trigger the suspicion of, uh, of amyloid. And then other manifestations, for example, AL amyloid has two pathognomonic features, the raccoon eye, the periorbital purpura, and the uh, macroglossia. And then uh, the patient might have the peripheral neuropathy, carpal tunnel syndrome, unexplained weight loss, fatigue, um, GI dysmotility, uh, urinary retention, uh, of course, renal and cardiac involvement. And the AA, uh, commonly here, at least it affects the renal more than the cardiac. Uh, and then the ATTR, which... Uh, Sometimes we see a patient with recurrent CHF exacerbation and then in their history, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, biceps tendon rupture, for example, and that also will trigger work up for ATTR amyloid. So certainly we, we should be all familiar with the systemic presentation because that's how we will move forward in the work up. And please stop me if there is any question or comment. And then the diagnosis, of course, will depend on the clinical presentation uh, lab, and uh, which I will talk about in the case presentation that I that I have. And then imaging findings, uh, we'll talk about it in the next few slides. And then the gold standard, was, which is the tissue biopsy. So uh, ATTR is the only one uh, that we might, or the cardio the cardiologist might start therapy without uh, tissue if they have a positive PYP scan. Uh, we'll talk about it, without other uh, suspicious for other types of amyloidosis like AL. So if the patient has a positive PYP scan, uh, no other systemic features of AL amyloid and negative immunofixation, they might comfortably start therapy for ATTR based on the PYP scan. Uh, however, uh, if the patient has uh, monoclonal gammopathy, they will need a tissue biopsy to prove the type of the amyloid because the totally different uh, type of treatment. So radiological, uh, classic teaching is kidney enlargement. However, that's in less than 15% of patients and probably occurs in the uh, early stage of disease. So not necessarily that we will find that in the kidney ultrasound. And then the classic echo findings, uh, thick valves, uh, concentric LVH, 
uh, atrial enlargement, um, interventricular uh, wall thickness of more than 12 millimeter, and global uh, uh, longitudinal strain with apical sparing, which uh, uh, for the cardiologist, they have the uh, uh, key feature called bull's eye uh, pattern. Uh, so all those findings, if we find it in our patient who present to the clinic with whatever proteinuria or recurrent CHF exacerbation should trigger further workup for uh, amyloidosis. And then cardiac MRI, which is now the gold standard uh, imaging for cardiac amyloid. Uh, classic finding is diffuse late uh, gadolinium enhancement. Uh, late uh, gadolinium enhance enhancement, which is which has high sensitivity and specificity for cardiac amyloid. However, it does not, and this is very important, it does not differentiate between subtypes of amyloid. So yes, it can say the patient has cardiac amyloid, but it will not provide further uh, uh, information about the subtype of the amyloid. So back to the PYP scan, it's a bone scintography um, uh, that has very high sensitivity uh, and specificity, specificity for ATTR whether wild or hereditary type. But we have to keep in mind that 8% of patients with AL amyloid might have positive PYP scan. So again, back to what I mentioned, if the patient has positive uh, PYP scan and uh, positive uh, monoclonal gammopathy, then we should have a tissue biopsy. And that's how it will look like. So uptake in the heart more than the contralateral chest, um, that will be diagnostic of uh, ATTR uh, amyloid. And then histology, I probably better to hand in that to Dr. Hussam. Uh, but but again, please feel, feel free to uh, ask me any question. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, yeah, Dr. Tari. Very interesting. I have a question. Of course, yeah. I thought that the presentation of a corporate tunnel is actually a red flag for RTTR. But I heard you mentioning that it could be a presentation of AL amyloid as well. That's true. It might. It certainly was this incidence, but it can. It can. It can be one of the features. It can be can one, be but one. not a presenting feature. But not. Not certainly not. Yeah. When I find bilateral carpal tunnel, first thing to come in my mind is ATTR amyloid for sure. Yeah. But it might, mm -hmm. in small percent of AL, it might present with carpal tunnel. Okay. I think you need Thanks to stop sharing your. Uh, okay, assalamu alaikum again. Uh, now we're, we're going to introduce uh, Professor Hussam Smail. Of course, uh, she doesn't need any uh, further introduction. Everyone in nephrology in uh, Egypt, Middle East, uh, Africa, and certainly all the Arab countries, as well as many of the European countries, and in the States and International Society of Nephrology nowadays, knows uh, very well who is Hussam Smail. She's a pioneer of nephropathology, and she is really nephropathologist. She, she, she's a nephrologist uh, by default, and then she's a pathologist. That's why she will speak within the clinical context of whatever related to the pathology as, as if she's a nephrologist. She's going to put her input in the treatment, not only in the diagnosis, and this is the nice thing about her reports, and uh, definitely, Usam is the best one to explore the uh, amyloidosis with her uh, preceding papers in the elect amyloidosis and the uh, immunophenotyping that she's been receiving from everywhere around Egypt to uh, immune type, the types of amyloidosis. Without further ado, uh, we introduce Professor Usam Smail, the head of pathology department in um, Bani Swift University uh, to go ahead and complete the uh, pathological phase of amyloidosis. Hussam. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Yasser. Uh, it's really a pleasure to participate again in one of these uh, webinars, and definitely it's more uh, of a pleasure to uh, to have this uh, joint presentation with Dr. Tar Ashur from uh, Cleveland Clinic. So I'm going to uh, discuss uh, very quickly uh, the, um, the pathological uh, aspects of amyloidosis. And uh, as you all know, since third year medical school, that uh, detection of amyloidosis could be, is done by a special stain, which we call congruent. 
and it's not as you can see on um on the left of the screen it's not this nice orange uh, color which is diagnostic for amyloid but it's rather this uh, on the right is green birefringence under polarized light so it's not enough to have this color this color has to birefringe under polarized light it does not always give you that very clear apple green birefringence sometimes we accept shades of golden yellow up to uh, green but it has to be within the range of uh, yellow uh, to green, at least to call it amyloidosis, because other types, because collagen fibers can stain orange with congruent and can by refringe under polarized light, but it gives you a white by refringence, not a colored by refringence, and it's a common source of uh, um, an overdiagnosis for amyloidosis by untrained pathologists to detect amyloid. Uh, is it moving? Okay. There are other ways, methods to detect amyloidosis, but they are not really common. We can use other stains or techniques like you can see, a um, you can detect the amyloidosis by fluorescence techniques, by using thioflavine S and T, by methyl violet stain, by sulfonated Asian blue, but they are all much less specific than uh, Congrad. And Congrad is the straightforward and the most commonly used uh, method for diagnosis of, amylo uh, of amyloid. And even those who use all other different methods and techniques, they still need to confirm by congruent. This is how amyloid looks like uh, by electron microscopy. And as you can see, these are randomly organized and branching fibrils, which is uh, uh, which is characteristic of amyloidosis as being one of the fibrillary diseases. However, again, we do not diagnose amyloid by EM. We diagnose amyloid just by congruent. And as I have mentioned, amyloid deposits do result in a wide range of clinical manifestations, as you can see. And these manifestations mainly, again, as uh, was mentioned, depend on the type of amyloidosis. So the type of amyloidosis differ. Some types are much more toxic than other types. And uh, the commonest example for this one is AL. So we consider AL is one of the most toxic types of amyloidosis if you compare it to other types of amyloid in relation to damage to the tissue. But also location will depend, will, will govern the clinical presentation, even the renal manifestation if we're talking kidney-wise. As again, we've mentioned, whether it's glomerular, whether it's tubular interstitial, whether it's vascular, and as expected, the amount of amyloid deposits that that is within the tissue. So the volume of amyloidosis itself will also uh, um, will also affect the clinical picture that we can see. Uh, again, as mentioned, the classification nomenclature we used an earlier and it's still uh, sometimes used grouping into primary systemic, secondary systemic, familial and localized amyloidosis, but this is not a useful classification anymore. Uh, the classification is mainly based on the main fibril protein because this is an important classification because the type of amyloidosis, as we just mentioned, is important because this is what governs your clinical presentation. And nowadays, this also, as you're going to hear later from Tari, governs the management. So we now know that we have different managements for AL amyloidosis. We have management for AA amyloid. We have an already an FDA approved drug for ATTR and so on. So we cannot classify amyloidosis anymore as being primary or secondary. We need to know which type of amyloid it is in order to, to understand the clinical presentation of the patient and to guide the management of the patient. This is our different shots from renal amyloidosis. And as you can see up here at the top on the left, even in ischemic glomerulitis, glomerulitis is slightly ischemic, it's, not, it's slightly shrunken. But then you can see in the arteriole that we have this mild expansion, these mild deposits here, which is, seems homogenous and a bit weak PAS positive. On the, on the right, you can see uh, this is a glomerulus, which has a mild to moderate mesangial um, expansion, again, by the amyloid deposit, what we call homogenous structureless pink deposit. So this is an H&E stain. Again, on the low left, another PAS stain which shows a more abundant uh, deposits of amyloid within the, uh, the glomeruli. Also in the uh, arteriols, all of this uh, 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 patches are mainly amyloidosis. And then on the on the right, on the low right, again, this is a PAS, but you can see here, this is actually was amyloid deposits, which was an odd case because it's a, it was a typically basement membrane deposits or a dominant, dominant membrane uh, deposits, which is not usually a feature of amyloidosis. Amyloid in general does not respect the glomerular basement membrane. 
Um, here is a case where actually this was a case of an AA amyloidosis, and a, surprisingly enough, I totally agree with Tariq that AA is mainly a glomerular amyloid, but sometimes, as this case, actually very rarely, it comes isolated as a vascular form of amyloidosis, or it could have been an early uh, presentation in the biopsy. And uh, this patient, as you can see, had amyloidosis only in his arterioles. This was a patient with a known uh, history of FMF. Uh, amyloid can also be uh, isolated in the tubular interstitial, as you can see here in between the arrows. And this is usually uh, could be a uh, elect amyloid. And if we have glomerular deposits as well, AL also sometimes cause interstitial deposits. So we come to the important part of amyloid typing. As I mentioned, as you can see, amyloidosis would look alike under light microscopy and uh, with congruent stain, they are all amyloid. But to differentiate between the different group of diseases, which we call amyloidosis, we do need the typing of amyloid. We can type amyloid by immunofluorescence on fresh non-formalin fixed tissue, by immunoperoxidase on formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, which I'm going to focus upon because this is what we are experienced in, by mass spectrometry. Sometimes we can use immunoelectron microscopy, not very common, not very practical or reproducible. And um, amino acid sequence analysis, again, was used uh, when we did not, uh, when mass spec was not really that uh, efficient. So between these, these are the commonest methods of uh, amyloid typing, which is used. On formula and fixed uh, tissue, we have a commercially available immunohistochemistry antibodies against amyloid for um, AA, amyloid A, kappa, lambda, afibrinogen, ATTR, as well as left two. The whole panel actually needs to be performed to avoid non-specific results and backgrounds, especially if you're looking for kappa and lambda. This means that even if I'm doubting that this uh, this amyloidosis could be an AL amyloid, we cannot just stain for kappa and lambda. We have also to stain for uh, the other types of amyloidosis, and we take the strongest signal of the stain which is there. Negative cases should be referred to larger centers with more sophisticated techniques like mass spec, for example. So if a case is negative for AA, AL, it's not left, it's negative for a ATTR, then we do need mass spec to detect what, what this is. That does not always mean that you're going to have a different type of amyloidosis than what you've stained for, but sometimes the commercial uh, uh, commercially, uh, uh, antibodies, whether immunohistochemistry or by fluorescence, can be negative for uh, the type of amyloid, amyloid, and then it turns to be uh, AL, for example, or lacked by mass spec. Can we suspect it just by light microscopy? Can we have some form of uh, morphological findings which can tell us that this is possibly this type of amyloidosis? Yes. For example, in EL amyloid, where you get what you call amyloid spicules, and I'm going to show them uh, for you. So uh, when we when I get to see this form of amyloid spicules, then I know that we're dealing with AL amyloidosis. If the deposits are extensively in the interstitium, then 90% this is going to turn to be lap two. If you have glomerular solidification without extra glomerular um, uh, deposits, then this is probably afibrinogen. So it's mainly and dominantly glomerular. No interstitium, no arterial, and um, uh, uh, yes, and no and tubular deposits. If it's predominant medullary, as Tori has also said, then you are probably dealing with apo A1 or apo 2 Also, TTR uh, tends to deposit in the medulla in, in, uh, of the kidney. And if you get this nodular glomerular pattern, this could be amyloid A or a, a, a apo a C2. So yes, we can have a hint or um, we can be quite sure what type of amyloid it is on light microscopy, but still, you can always be surprised. So distribution, a, this distribution pattern slash morphology should never substitute for amyloid typing. It can help guide the typing process if you don't want to go through the whole uh, panel of uh, the antibodies, which is going to be very costly, but it cannot substitute 
for the typing process itself. This is an example for amyloid A. And as you can see, uh, this is the uh, HME, and you can see the amyloid deposits with the typical, uh, what we call typical microscopic description of these homogeneous structureless mesangial deposits, which goes also affects the glomerular basement membrane segmentally. And uh, this is the amino histochemistry uh, for it. Uh, amyloid A is very reproducible on uh, immunoperoxidase, and it gives really a very clean uh, form of uh, staining with a very good uh, signal. Uh, AL amylo uh, sorry, AA amyloid is characterized by what we call a streaming pattern. Again, this is by immuno, and this is what we call a streaming pattern. You get bands of the amyloid across a uh, medullary tissue, and the more advanced the amyloidosis is, the more you're going to see the streaming pattern, which usually also involves arteries and blood vessels. This is a characteristic feature of amyloid A in biopsies. Uh, amyloid OA, as other types of amyloidosis, can come uh, superimposed on a pre-existing renal disease, like in this young male who was 27 years old. Actually, this is Ahmed's case, and he presented with proteinuria 4.6, CM creat 1.5, and on light microscopy, he had focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, as you can see, and even we can call it a perihilar variant, but surprisingly, on Congoret, this segmental sclerosis also had um, amyloid uh, within it, and this amyloid turned to be amyloid A positive. So routine congoret actually is a must for all renal biopsy cases, at least the native renal biopsies. This is a variety of uh, cases from AL amyloid, whether copper or lambda A type. Again, you can see it gives you the same like microscopy picture, a predominant glomerular uh, pattern. It's really extremely rare, or I have to say I've never seen an AL amyloid, which did not involve a glomeruli. So if there is no glomerular amyloid deposits, AL does not come to mind. It's going to be very, uh, really very difficult to consider it AL amyloidosis. Uh, AL is in, in more than 75% of cases is a lambda phenotype rather than a copper. But you can see this is lambda staining of AL amyloid. And uh, this one on, on um, a, a right low is a copper staining for AL amyloid as well. And it, it gives a, a, a very good signal most of the time on immunohistochemistry. This is what we call AL spicules. And we actually had some cases with a classic clashes uh, type, but I couldn't find the picture, but you can see here, this is, uh, uh, this is the glomerular basement membrane. This orange patch is the amyloid. And uh, look at the electron microscopy. It matches the same uh, segment of the capillary loop. And you can see how amyloidosis does not respect glomerular basement membranes. It goes beyond it, and it gives you this uh, these spikes along uh, the glomerular basement membrane, which we call AL spicules, a feature which is characteristic of AL uh, amyloidosis. Again, you can see it here within the glomerular basement membrane. And uh, again, this is AL amyloid, and I just wanted to show you that AL amyloidosis can be really uh, minimal, even much less than that within uh, uh, the glomerular line. So this was Lund, uh, a case of Lund. Then we have AA, uh, A fibrinogen. And as I said, fibrinogen tends to have this solidification of the uh, glomeruli. It is a uh, very congophilic, like, uh, like lect. And as you can see with the Congo red, absolutely no other amyloid deposits within a, uh, the kidney except in the uh, glomeruli. It has what we call a cotton ball uh, appearance, and it can make you suspect fibrinogen, especially with a whole panel of, uh, of uh, antibodies, which is negative. This is an afibrinogen, and this is, comes from a patient who was recurrent a post-transplant, um, him and his brother and his uncle, they all had the same uh, disease. This is a apolite protein, as we've discussed, this is mainly a modulary type of amyloidosis, but there is a novel type of, uh, of apo uh, also, which is C2, and this one is glomerular, and it does not seem to have any characteristic morphological findings so far, so it still needs it to have immuno, but it's not a common type. And finally, lect, which seems to be very prevalent within our uh, population, and this is the, the this is lect as you can see the brown and the blue by immuno uh, peroxidase again a very nice clean and reproducible uh, antibody by immuno uh, peroxidase 
And this is uh, this one was glomerular. And as I have mentioned, LECT can give you all uh, the variety of clinical presentations, starting from non-nephrotic range proteinuria to nephrotic proteinuria to a AKI to um, end stage renal disease. It depends which stage and where is the main area of involvement. But as we all know, it mainly affects the cortical uh, interstitium or at least early on in the disease. And you can see here, these are very minimal lack deposits, which are detected only along the tubular basement membranes and in the restitium and in some arterioles with a completely negative uh, glomerular and uh, glomeruli. And uh, this patient uh, was biopsied for something else and uh, not for lact amyloidosis. So this comes with what we can do with immunoperxidase. And I have to say that with immunoperxidase, we can diagnose or phenotype at least up to 85% of cases and more than 95% of the types which involve uh, the kidney are either amyloid A, AL or, um, or LAC2. So from the renal point of view, uh, we can phenotype up to uh, 90 or even more than 90% of the cases with just with routine immunoprexidase. But mass spec is needed in some cases where you can get an, a negative immunoprexidase or an unknown type of amyloid or a type you just don't stain for. And the rationale for uh, the application of these proteomic methods for amyloid typing lies that we do have a relative abundance of amyloid protein in tissue, where frequently this amyloid protein is going to be the dominant protein. So this is the principal application of MS actually was in the field of amyloidosis by detecting the molecular, ma uh, molecular mass and identify the type of protein. This comes from our own paper for uh, lact amyloidosis and for the cases which we phenotyped by MS. And you can see this This was a case from uh, lact, uh, lact 2 amyloidosis. So you have to, to get all the serum amyloid P components. So you know that this protein is amyloidosis. And then you, you these, the, the MS detects the highest mass for the specific protein, which was in that case, leukocyte uh, cell-derived amyloid. amyloid. So amyloid type typing by MS is now considered the gold standard for classification of amyloidosis. It provides accurate typing on formal infixed paraffin embedded tissue, as well as fat pad uh, aspirates. It can detect amyloidogenic mutations in hereditary amyloidosis. So yes, by MS, it can help you to know whether this is a wild type of DTR or not. Um, and it can identify, of course, new forms of amyloidosis. It's a single test. It has a higher sensitivity and specificity than any other test. And from this aspect, it's less costly since you do not stain for all the panel of immunoperoxidase. However, it's an unavailable test for frozen tissue. If you get negative IF staining for lambda and kappa with the negative equivalent staining for serum amyloid E and LAC2, so it's gonna also be negative. It can give equal IF intensity staining for copper and lanta and strong IF staining for IgG and or um, IgA. So actually, this is where uh, we need uh, MS, and this is this can happen in only around fifteen percent of uh, cases. Uh, I'll just uh, finalize by showing you that amyloidosis itself as a disease can cause other renal regions. And so you, uh, amyloid can cause crescents, and this usually happens when um, a, patients are uh, progressive, uh, they are progressing in the disease, and this causes a deterioration of the patient's condition, especially renal function. There is absolutely no response to treatment or the regular treatments, uh, whether you're going to give uh, cyclophosphamide or any other or steroids. These crescents, they do not respond, and usually these patients deteriorate faster to end, uh, to end stage than any other uh, patients. So you can get crescents with amyloidosis, and this is because amyloid, the amyloid ruptures the glomerular basement membrane, and then you can have uh, an irritation of the parietal porocytes, and it can give you a crescent. And this form of crescents, we see commonest with amyloid A, because this is one of the most chronic forms of amyloidosis. Uh, so you can see here, again, uh, amyloid with, uh, with crescents. And this is with a crescent in a trichrome in a trichrome stain. The other lesion, which is common uh, again to see in amyloidosis, is thrombotic microangiopathy. So, and these patients usually present with uncontrolled hypertension, 
and can evolve into a hypertensive crisis. This is due to the amyloid deposits within the blood vessels and within uh, the vascular uh, uh, tree of the kidney. And this is, you can see the amyloidosis and the uh, um, endothelial swelling and cord antimal degeneration within the arteries. Again, we do see commonest with amyloid A, but this is because amyloid A is the most common type of amyloidosis that we see, but we also uh, see it with AL, I have to say. Again, this is, you can see with congruent and you can see the thrombotic micro uh, angiopathy, which is superimposed on amyloidosis. So this is an important finding to report on the pathology reports, because then you can know that your patients can complicate with hypertension or can uh, um, rapidly progress to end-stage renal disease. Okay, I'll stop here. And if anybody has any questions. Okay, so, so uh, okay, I'll have so, a case so presentation. So continue with Professor Tari again, okay, yes. Yes. Okay. So I have a case presentation now. Uh, that's a patient that I saw around six months ago, 47 year old uh, male who present with a past history of bronchial asthma, renal stones, overactive bladder, history of urinary retention before, and he had vasectomy in 2016. Uh, he was seen actually by one of my colleagues at the urology, uh, urology uh, clinic. Uh, and incidentally, he was found to have three plus protein in his uh, dipstick. So, uh, uh, I saw him the following week, uh, totally asymptomatic, very fit guy, physically active. Uh, and uh, his uh, physical exam was totally normal. Uh, blood pressure uh, was 127 over 78, no orthostatic hypotension. His weight was 80 uh, kilograms. Uh, uh, his UA, notably, noticeably, his UA in 2019 was totally normal without proteinuria or hematuria. However, when I saw him in the clinic, he again, uh, or that was actually the dipstick that my colleague saw, uh, three plus proteins, uh, no hematuria, and uh, he did a protein creatinine ratio that was 1.6. And then I repeated that uh, and it came back three uh, milligram per milligram. And his albumin creatinine ratio was 2025, uh, 225 milligram per gram. Serum creatinine 0.88 milligram per deciliter and albumin of 3.7 gram per deciliter. Serum calcium was normal. Uh, so I sent for, uh, you know, all the serology, the usual serology workup, ANA, double-stranded, uh, complements, ANCA, uh, remote hepatitis panel, uh, and all that came back negative. And his SPEP was negative as well. However, the serum immunofixation came back positive for IgG lambda. His serum kappa was 14.8, uh, and his lambda was 62.5 ratio of 0.24 and back when i mentioned before also about the lab i think when i whenever i see the that ratio on the lower side like this with a positive immunofixation of course that trigger uh, you know some uh, suspicious about al amyloid uh, he, he had all the reasons anyway for a kidney biopsy and uh sorry yeah uh his uh, kidney biopsy showed uh renal AL amyloid. Uh, I think I can handle the, the following slide to back to Dr. Wissam since she will go through the, the histology here. So uh, I'll, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll keep it chair. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll keep it chair. Sure. Yeah. Yes, please. So you can see here, this is a renal cortex and we have around three glomeruli here. And um, this is of course a very low power, but it can, uh, even on the stain, you can see that we have do have a mild uh, interstitial uh, affection. Uh, and maybe uh, some mild uh, tubular affection. Can we go? But the glomerular, even on this low power, looks fine. Yeah, can we go on a higher power, please? Yeah. And then we can go on a higher power here, and this is a congruent stain, and guess what? It's just this very small, minimal deposits here. The green arrows are a bit uh, lower, but if you can see my, uh, my arrow, it's, it's just two, this, two very small orange spots. This is uh, the amyloidosis. And I have mentioned, as I've mentioned, that um, when you get it so minimal and with a significant proteinuria, then I also always think AL amyloid. This is a higher power, and you can see this very, just these two patches, which are congruent uh, positive. And this is how you can easily miss AL amyloidosis on, uh, on biopsies. And these biopsies can pass diagnosed as minimal change. Yes, please, Tori. And then you can see by Congo Red, this is a very nice apple green uh, by refringence, which also highlighted another uh, area of amyloid we haven't seen even by uh, Congo Red. So this is amyloidosis. 
and copper and lambda, and this is by immunofluorescence. And although both seems to be positive, you can see on the right that you have a very strong signal for uh, lambda. And so this confirms that this is AL amyloid lambda type. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, again, as uh, Dr. Hussain mentioned, uh, renal AL amyloid. Uh, so of course the follow-up uh, follow uh, investigations will include bone marrow biopsy. Uh, to rule out uh, multiple myeloma. The patient only had 5% uh, plasma cells and he had negative stain for amyloid. Uh, he had negative skeletal survey, no lytic lesions and uh, no hypercalcemia. Uh, 24 hours, and I wanna also point to the 24 hour uh, urine collection, specifically in amyloid. I think a couple of studies showed that it's more accurate compared to the ratio. And it's really important to get the right number uh, because the renal staging and the uh, uh, renal response all based on the number of uh, or the amount of uh, proteinuria. So I really we need very accurate uh, quantification of the proteinuria in, in uh, those type of patients. Uh, so it showed six grams. As you can see, it's different compared to the ratio that we got. Uh, his UPEP showed mainly albumin, uh, negative M protein uh, in the urine immunofixation. Uh, his NT pro uh, was 74 uh, nanogram per, per ml and um, cardiac troponin was seven microgram per liter. And again, those are important to rule out cardiac involvement. His echo also was normal. And uh, the uh, he, he had a positive uh, 11 to 14, uh, 11, uh, 14 translocation. And this is might not affect the, the management early on. However, for people who relapse, they might benefit from uh, a plasma cell directed therapy that is uh, that can uh, that can act better on people who have this uh, mutation. Uh, there are studies also ongoing about that, uh, but uh, so far I think they they do the test and they keep it in case uh, relapse happen uh, later. So we already spoke about the pathology, and then uh, so you know again if we want to uh, you know uh, summarize the patient renal al amyloid with elevated lambda light chain uh, crap criteria were absent bone marrow showed only 5% positive 11 14 translocation uh, no m spike in the serum and the urine uh, and then the involved light chains which are the lambda are 63.1 mg per liter the uninvolved uh, which are the kappa 16.2 and the patient had six grams in the urine, mainly albumin. So we will talk about those stages in the next slides, but his cardiac stage uh, considered Mayo 2012 stage one. We used the, that specific cardiac uh, staging here at Cleveland Clinic. And the renal stage, which is not commonly used, but uh, I'll show some data about that. Uh, he's considered stage two. And then it's, it's important, at least for us, to try to stage the patient because that can predict the renal outcome. So uh, back to AL uh, amyloidosis, median age, uh, 63 years old, uh, 1.3 can be diagnosed at younger age, just like, uh, uh, you know, our patient was uh, obviously younger. 70% uh, of all amyloid cases uh, in the United States, around 4,000 new cases every year. Uh, I'm sure it's more than that, but certainly one of the very hard disease to diagnose. Uh, most common organ are heart, kidney and heart, and cardiorenal involvement can be up to 40% at the time of the diagnosis. A small uh, indolent, uh, you know, like proliferating, proliferating clone in the plasma cells, uh, just like our patient, only 5%. However, it produced non-functional immunoglobulins, have tendency for misfolding, and then beta bleated sheets uh, on the tissues. Uh, who are who are at risk? People who have history of MGUS, multiple myeloma, uh, 10 to 15 percent of the myeloma patient might turn to AL amyloid, Waldenstrom, and CLL. Uh, and really, to uh, to increase the sensitivity of the of diagnosing AL amyloid, we should probably depend on the SPEP immunofixation, free light chain in the serum, and the urine immunofixation. As we saw in our patient, for example, his SPEP was negative. His immunofixation was positive and the kappa lambda ratio was suggestive of amyloid. So if, if we only send for SPEP, we, I, I could have meant, missed that diagnosis at least before the kidney biopsy. So in terms of renal staging, is there a staging? Yes, we'll talk about it later. Uh, historically, there is a 
definition for the renal response uh, after starting therapy, which is uh, more than or a 30% uh, drop in the proteinuria or drop in the proteinuria less than half gram per 24 hours in the in, and that should be in the absence of renal progression, which is worsening in the creatinine uh, by 25% over baseline. Cardiac staging, uh, there are two, uh, two Mayo staging. Now we are using the 2012. The difference between them, uh, it, historically, it used to be troponin T and NT, uh, proby MP. Now in 2012, we used the uh, cutoff of uh, certain cutoffs of the cardiac troponin T and uh, NT MP, and they added the difference between involved uh, and non-involved light chains. So uh, if the if the patient has no has everything is uh, negative, then it's class one, better prognosis, and then uh, one out of three, class two, uh, and then two out of three, class three, and then if the patient has um, all the risk factors, then he is class four. Class four certainly is very bad prognosis. Uh, the uh, survival can be uh, like the median survival six months. Of course, that might change uh, now that we are using new therapists and they might uh, run more research about restaging. But so far, that's what we know from the prior staging. Uh, now, and there is actually, and we use it, if uh, in the European uh, 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 staging, the plus the they divide stage three to 3A and 3B. 3B also has poor prognosis and 3B if the anti BMP more than uh, 8,500 uh, nanogram per liter. And uh, I always remind myself to look on the units because different centers use different units. So it's always important to look on the unit used to stratify the patient the right way. Now, cardiac response, uh, in brief, of course, drop in the anti uh, and improvement in the uh, heart failure uh, symptoms. And cardiac progression worsening in the BRUBMP from the baseline and worsening symptoms and drop in the ejection fraction in the echo. Now, hematological response, and this is very, very, very important because that's what the hematologist will aim for to reflect to organ response. So complete response, which, or very good partial response, which almost always what we would like to see. Complete response is negative, uh, serum and urine immunofixation and normal free light chain levels and ratio. Now the very good partial response uh, will be divided based on the baseline uh, difference between the free light chains. If the difference is more than 50, then we look for difference less than 40 milligram per liter between the uh, involved and non-involved. When the difference is less than 50, it's hard to, uh, you know, uh, comment on the on the response. So we based on the light chains. So we look on the M protein response. More than 90 percent decrease in the serum M protein, and looking for urine M protein less than uh, 100 milligram per 24 hours. And the partial response certainly. Uh, it's uh, you know worse more than uh, more than fifty percent drop in the uh, difference between the free light chain, uh, and if the difference is less than fifty, then you look on the drop more than just more than fifty percent or equal in the serum protein uh, and drop in the urine M protein uh, less than nine two hundred milligram per twenty four hours, or no response, and then progression from complete response any abnormal free light chain ratio uh, and uh, relapse from any other response, whether it was very good partial or a partial response. So those patients should be followed very closely. And I see in the hematology clinic, they are probably seen every three months to look on those. Now, uh, back to my talk about the staging. Uh, so Dr. Palladini, uh, who uh, is a big uh, uh, researcher, uh, in the field of AL amyloid, he had a study in 2014 uh, to look for the renal outcome uh, in the AL amyloid patients. Uh, so they looked on the database uh, in two big centers in Italy and uh, uh, Germany with the patients who were diagnosed with AL amyloid between 2004 and 2012. Um, and then they looked uh, on uh, their hematological response based on the definitions that we mentioned. And the end point was the uh, uh, with the renal survival defined as the time from diagnosis to dialysis initiation. Uh, and as we can see here, 
the, uh, the, the, the median proteinuria on diagnosis was five grams, probably similar somehow to my patient. And the EGFR uh, also the median was 62 ml per minute. Most of the patients had CKD stage one and two and three on diagnosis on both cohorts. Uh, and uh, those are, that's, this is the therapy that they got. Uh, most of the people, in uh, at least in the first line in Italy, they got uh, plasma cell directed therapy. Uh, versus in uh, Heidelberg in Germany, most of them they got autologous stem cell transplant in the first line. And then the proposed design for renal staging was stage one, uh, proteinuria less than five grams per 24 hours, EGFR more than 50 ml per minute, and stage three, both more than five gram proteinuria and uh, GFR less than 50 ml, ml per minute. And stage two, it's either the proteinuria more than five gram or the GFR less than 50 ml per minute. And then, as you can see here, uh, the people who had stage three uh, uh, had uh, were dialysis dependent uh, at three years, around 60% of them versus 0% in stage one in the uh, Italian cohort. So, uh, similar, similar findings in the patients in Heidelberg as well, uh, based on the same staging. And then uh, based on renal progression, so uh, they looked on the people who had renal progression at six months. Also, people who had uh, renal progression at six months uh, had uh, more uh, uh, dialysis at uh, three years, both in Italy and uh, Heidelberg. And then uh, progression based on the renal response. People who had renal response at uh, six months uh, also had uh, uh, better renal survival at three years. Uh, those are uh, who didn't have good response versus good response at six months, also similar in both cohorts. Uh, and also based on the hematological response, whoever had good hematological response, uh, whether complete or very good partial response, as we mentioned early, had better renal survival on both cohorts. So again, renal progression, renal response, hematological response, three of them showed good uh, p-value to predict uh, the renal uh, survival. So from our standpoint, proteinuria and EGFR independently predicted progression to dialysis. So that's, I think this is probably the easiest way to show the patients uh, if they are stage one, two-year risk of dialysis will be 0 to 3%. Of course, mild increase annual risk after that versus a stage three, 60% uh, to 75% uh, two-year risk, uh, uh, two risk of dialysis with higher risk uh, annually after that. That's this is the staging at baseline. Now, uh, the, if we stratify them based on the renal response, also, whoever had better renal response at six months, uh, their two-year risk of dialysis was 3% to 10%, and then uh, 5 to 10% uh, five-year risk of dialysis. Of course, uh, whoever had renal progression uh, at six months had worse outcome in terms of renal uh, survival. So how about overall survival? Uh, the renal staging in this study did not affect the overall survival. Uh, the staging at baseline and the renal response at six months also did not affect the overall uh, survival, which was again another study by Dr. Leng at Mayo Clinic. So we'll also go uh, quickly through this study, which was done in 2013 uh, on patients who had a uh, bone marrow transplant from 1995 to uh, 2010. Uh, so they looked retrospective uh, for patients. The inclusion criteria was patients who had proteinuria more than one gram, and they were not on dialysis uh, at baseline and within one year of, uh, of bone marrow transplant and minimum follow-up of one year. They were about uh, 156 patients evaluated for renal response criteria and ability to predict overall uh, survival. Uh, so the median proteinuria on diagnosis uh, on, on, by the time of the study was six grams. 
Um, and the serum creatinine was one milligram per deciliter. So as we can see here, whoever uh, had better uh, reduction or more uh, reduction in uh, proteinuria had a better overall survival. Uh, so uh, whether uh, we achieve proteinuria response more than 95 percent, 75 to less than 90, even anything above 75 percent reduction in proteinuria reflected to a better survival. And then uh, in terms of hematological response, also whoever uh, achieved uh, good, uh, like complete response or very good partial response had better overall survival. Also combined uh, 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 for, uh, for patients who had uh, more than 75% uh, reduction proteinuria, complete uh, uh, response or very good partial response hematologically uh, had the best overall survival. Uh, even that compared to people who only achieved uh, hematological response or only achieved more than 75 uh, proteinuria response. So uh, bottom line is we are looking for uh, hematological response, uh, renal response for better survival. Uh, and that's what's, uh, what I basically mentioned. Uh, the ri a rise in the serum creatinine more than 25% in the setting of proteinuria reduction was not associated with worse overall survival, which kind of what we know already that proteinuria is linked to mortality and probably that rise in the 25% in the creatinine that might happen will not affect the overall survival. How about patients with advanced CKD? You know, that's a valid question that we ask ourselves now. How about people who have GFR at the time of diagnosis less than 20 ml per minute? That what was addressed uh, by Dr. Tamer Rezek et al. in, uh, uh, in uh, England. Uh, so they, uh, they, they ran a prospective observational study uh, and they looked on the renal and patient outcome from 2009 till 2015, um, based on the speed and depth of hematological response to chemotherapy. So they had uh, uh, AL amyloid patients, 672 patients. Uh, 84 of them had EGFR less than 20 ml per minute at diagnosis. Uh, 45 patients had uh, renal limited uh, diagnosis, no cardiac diagnosis, uh, no, no cardiac amyloid. Uh, and that's what I basically mentioned. Of course, the median EGFR is low. Um, so uh, no surprise, uh, the patients who had renal isolated uh, amyloid had better overall survival to start with compared to a uh, patient who had cardiac and renal amyloid. We're talking about 50 months compared to nine months median survival. Uh, and then uh, the patient uh, survival, sorry, based on the free light chain reduction at three months. Uh, so here, when they applied the, the typical definition of the uh, complete response that I mentioned uh, before, the difference between free light chains, between the involved and non-involved, less than 40 milligram per liter, uh, actually, they didn't it didn't show difference in the survival between people who had a uh, complete response based on that definition versus people who didn't have complete response. Again, that's based on the classical definition of Inter uh, International Society of Amyloid. Interestingly, what they found is if they achieve more than 90% drop in the, in the difference between involved and non-involved uh, light chains, that's what will uh, affect the overall survival. So really the on those people who have very low EGFR, you need to achieve deep hemato very deep hematological response to have a meaningful outcome in terms of overall survival. Sorry. And then uh, they looked on the renal survival uh, also based on the free light chain reduction. Again, when we applied the, the classical definition that we talked about, for the free for the hematological response, it didn't show difference versus that deep response that we talked about, more than 90% reduction. It showed uh, 
uh, improvement in the overall survival for those who achieved more than 90%. Also, they compared people who achieved more than 90% uh, hematological response at three months versus 12 months. And those who achieved uh, uh, deep response at three months also had better survival compared to who had 90% response uh, or uh, hematological response at 12 months. So the summary of this is achieving very deep hematological response quickly at three months is the way to uh, improve uh, the renal survival on those uh, patients who start with very low EGFR. Um, and that's also, they also looked on the people who had renally isolated amyloid, same, same, uh, same outcome uh, in terms of the, uh, the need for deep uh, hem uh, hematological response and quick hematological response for meaningful uh, renal survival. Uh, again, the composite endpoints, death or dialysis based on the free light chain reduction at three months was better on people who achieved a uh, deep response. So that's basically what I mentioned. And the conclusion is this data is promising to treat people who start with low, G low GFR, um, but we need rapid and intense reduction in the uh, free light chains uh, to be capable to preserve the renal function for longer time. So obviously different uh, differences from Palladini study, uh, timing of the hematological response is important for those people. Um, and it should be very deep hematological response for meaningful outcome. Because in Palladini study, the, again, they just followed the classical definition of a hematological response. And uh, they talked about response at six months with good outcome versus here, it should be very deep response and at three months. Um, I think that's basically what I uh, mentioned also. So how about dialysis in those population? Uh, traditionally, uh, the outcome is very poor on the AL uh, or the amyloid patients in general. So uh, that was the biggest study that I found uh, done in Australia on around 60,000 patients. Uh, that uh, had dialysis between 1963 to 2001. Around 500 patients had uh, renal, um, uh, renal uh, amyloidosis. The median survival was two years versus 4.5 years uh, for other causes of end-stage renal disease. Interestingly, there was no difference in survival between patients who had hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis in that study. Uh, and the uh, proportion of cardiac death in amyloid was comparable to other causes. However, death from cardiac failure per se was higher in patients who had amyloid versus non-amyloid. Uh, uh, and the, that significant difference in the survival was constant in all eras, like in the 1960s, when they compared the patients who had amyloid versus non-amyloid, the same percent continued later on when they, uh, when they compared them in the 2000s. And they found that, uh, uh, the older uh, patients with, re with renal amyloid, so the, the, the worst outcome uh, for uh, survival. So back to our patient, it started on daratimumab, which is now FDA approved. We'll talk about the study. Bortezimab, uh, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone. He received three cycles. Creatinine remained at baseline, 0.8 milligram per deciliter. Uh, 24 hours, actually, 24 hour protein is still at six grams. Uh, although he actually achieved a hemat a hematological response, still he didn't have organ response, but that's kind of expected because there is a lag between the hematological response and the organ response. Uh, based on, on the stages, he is a stage two. So I think uh, he's... And of course, he doesn't have also cardiac amyloid. So overall, he has favorable prognosis. Uh, interestingly, he had a small M protein now in the SPEP, but that can be expected in the daratimumab because the daratimumab is monoclonal antibody and that can actually cause false positive in the SPEP. So we might expect small spike, typically IgG kappa uh, in the SPEP. 
and we that can be explained by the daratimumab. But otherwise, all his, his other hematological parameters are better. So, uh, as we all know, the AL therapy progressed over years. Uh, uh, Colchicine in the past, probably that was used for any type. And then autologous stem cell transplant, which is certainly uh, can induce a durable response. But unfortunately, it, it only uh, it only for eligible patients. So very limited number of patients who will benefit from that. And there was a study in France, uh, I think in 2004 or around that time, that compared the autologous stem cell transplant versus the melphalan and dex, dexamethasone. And actually, the chemotherapy showed better outcome. However, they didn't select the patients. I think the 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 the, the lesson from that study that really people who have who sh who should be considered for stem cell transplant should be healthy, uh, minimal cardiac uh, involvement, better kidney function, uh, better uh, uh, functional uh, status, and um, uh, younger age, probably less than 70 years, to be considered for stem cell transplant to, con to, predict, to predict better outcome. And then uh, later on, uh, proteasome inhibition with the cyborg D, and then now adding the ratimumab, which again is now uh, FDA approved. So overall management, supportive care, which is multidisciplinary between um, a nephrologist, cardiologist, uh, and uh, hematologist, palliative care, uh, plasma cell directed therapy. Now, uh, now there are targeting uh, therapies for deposits under study, the KL101, for example, it's another monoclonal antibody. Uh, the phase two trial was done, uh, or done at least in our center, one of our centers was, one of the centers was Cleveland Clinic. It showed promising uh, uh, results in terms of uh, side, less uh, low burden of side effects and a good renal outcome. However, very small, uh, you know, like 25 patients or so, and the patients were only was also uh, using uh, other uh, uh, therapies, so uh, it didn't still ma make it for for being approved. But there are uh, randomized trials ongoing now, so we'll see what it will show hopefully in the next few years. Uh, back to the daratimumab uh, IgG kappa, as I mentioned, uh, and uh, direct anti tumor immunomodulatory mechanism. And uh, the outcome was uh, were learned from the uh, from using it in myeloma patients and relapsing AL amyloid patients. So uh, uh, there is a phase three uh, study that was done in I think it the it was published in 2020. They evaluated the safety and efficacy of subcutaneous daratimumab plus cyborg D in patients with newly diagnosed uh, AL amyloid. Uh, uh, safety run-in phase was showed uh, acceptable side effect profile. Um, this has, these are the baseline uh, characteristics. Uh, I think more importantly is we know that uh, most of the patients had stage one renal uh, disease uh, based on the you know the stage the staging that I mentioned early uh, stage one most of them uh, some of them stage two, and then the least number was a stage three. And uh, although they excluded uh, anything above, uh, like beyond 3A cardiac stage, but some 3B made it to the study. Uh, you know, we don't need to, ta to talk about the regimen, uh, like the frequency of, uh, of dosing, but uh, they randomized people to either receive DARA, Cyber, Cyber D versus Cyber D only, uh, and then uh, after six months, uh, whoever received their daratimumab and cyborg D, the cyborg D was stopped and the patient was continued to uh, on daratimumab every four weeks versus observation uh, in the other uh, group. And uh, uh, the hematological uh, response, overall response was higher on the DARA group. Uh, what was really significant that anything about like complete, whether complete response or very good 
partial response was remarkably uh, higher in the daratimumab group. And as I mentioned, the hematological response is important because it reflects to uh, organ response. Uh, as you can see here, uh, six-month cardiac response was higher in the DARA group, same as the renal response, 54% uh, versus 27% in the uh, cyber D group alone. Uh, and that also show uh, the hazard, uh, the Kaplan-Meier curve for major organ deterioration, hematological progression, or death. Uh, better results in the data group versus the control group. And the hematological response was overall uh, in the all groups were uh, be benefited from. Uh, uh, the DARA, uh, uh, in the DARA uh, line, um, all the cardiac stages, uh, renal stages. Uh, so basically, uh, all of them had hem a good hematological response, which again uh, reflected to better organ response. So FDA approved sub-Q uh, DARA for use in combination for, uh, with CyberD in treatment with, of patients with newly diagnosed light chain amyloid, which exactly uh, what was applied to our patient. Now we might argue and say, should he been considered for bone marrow? Yes, he is a well fit for that. I think uh, in, 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 in most of the centers now, at least in our center and some other centers from the talks that I heard, uh, given the results of this study, they prefer to start with the DARA and the cyborg D quickly uh, because the bone marrow transplant process might take longer time. So they prefer to achieve a quicker response. Uh, and then uh, if the patient achieve quicker, good response, then it might be a discussion with the patient whether to uh, observe versus go ahead with the uh, bone marrow transplant uh, uh, down the road. If the patient didn't respond to that regimen and still eligible for bone marrow transplant, then should be considered for bone marrow transplant. So certainly it's still on the table specifically for that patient, for example. So take home message, message kidney is affected in different types of amyloid, just like uh, Dr. Hussain mentioned. Even in the ATTR, uh, although we don't biopsy those patients most of the time because there is evidence of cardiac involvement somehow, whether by images, uh, also our cardiologists are uh, aggressive uh, in cardiac biopsies. So if the patient has a diagnosis and going to start on tefamidus, for example, so there is no value of kidney biopsy unless we are suspecting another process for the kidney disease. Uh, nephrologists should be familiar with extra renal manifestations of systemic amyloid, uh, whether symptoms, signs, uh, echo findings, uh, and others. Uh, accurate diagnosis uh, is very important at the type at the time of diagnosis because that will dictate the therapy, which is totally different between different types of amyloids. Early diagnosis is important uh, because treating early will induce quick response, and that will reflect to quick organ response. And of course, it's uh, as always multidisciplinary approach. And uh, that's my end. The end of my talk. Thank you, Dr. Tarek. Thank you. For this highly elegant talk and very comprehensive presentation. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Professor Hussam, for uh, your Thanks. great presentation for the pathology. So please, Dr. Ahmed, we have many questions and many comments Thank from you. Professor. Thank you, yes. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, Professor Ayman Rifai, uh, the President-Elect yes. of the Egyptian Society of Nephrology, wants to comment, please. Uh, okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, oh. Dr. Yasser, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Tar. Yes, Dr. Yeah. Ahmed, please. Please, please Dr. Ayman. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yasser, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Sam, Dr. Tar. I really enjoyed the the talk from the early beginning. 
uh, especially I have some interest and relation with, uh, with this disease uh, as this was the subject matter of my uh, master degree in 1990. We uh, studied the impact of uh, amyloidosis on the outcome of kidney transplantation. Uh, I think this was not touched in the in the talk. So at that time, we had 16 uh, transplants with original kidney disease amyloidosis. Most of them were secondary to uh, familiar Mediterranean fever. At that time, the uh, all the reports uh, uh, showed that amyloidosis had poor outcome. Kidney transplantation has out poor outcome with patients with amyloidosis. And this was not the case among our uh, recipients. Uh, so we, we reported this in uh, the nephrology dialysis transplantation in 1994. And then we reported the long term in 2003 in the American Journal of Kidney Disease about 23 uh, cases. Uh, all the cases have um, a comparable uh, outcome, like the non amyloidotic uh, cases. Um, uh, we had only cases of recurrence and this was owing to the uh, non-compliance on the uh, colchicine uh, therapy and uh, as you know that this disease is uh, common among Jewish so most of the reports com coming from Israel the one of the of these uh, reports board, uh, highlighted that there is a critical dose of colchicine which is 1.5 milligram per day. Uh, if it is less than that, recurrence will occur. Uh, the other point that we reported also that there is a syndrome of neuromyopathy among those patients. And this neuromyopathy is related to the combination of colchicine and cyclosporin. Both of them, of them increase the toxicity of each other, uh, resulting in a, a picture of a neuromyopathy. Uh, and we reported also this neuromyopathy in the uh, American Journal of Kidney Disease. Um, uh, I would like to highlight that uh, actually amyloidosis is a serious disease. And uh, me, myself, hit the disease very much. We lost three of our colleagues with uh, FMF amyloidosis severe, and the severity of the disease when it affects the GIT, causing a severe malabsorption syndrome uh, and protein losing entropathy, severe cachexia and loss of weight, which is fatal. Uh, uh, again, uh, an interesting case among our transplant, this was a potential kidney donor, a father from Alexandria, 59 years old, who, who was donating uh, his kidney to his daughter and intraoperatively, we could not harvest the kidney. There was a lot of adhesions ar around the kidney. And uh, so the surgeon had a biopsy from these adhesions, and this kidney was not uh, harvested or donated. Interestingly, that this was adhesions was uh, busted for congrate, and this was amyloidosis, extra renal. And uh, this was a, a very strange and rare case. Um, last point uh, for Dr. Hussam, that uh, before the immunobrox days staining to differentiate between AA and LL amyloidosis, we used a simple method, which is the addition of potassium permanganate to the amyloid material. If it dissolves, so it's AA protein. If not, so it's AL. Uh, it, it, this is still valid. This is an uh, yeah, maybe primitive or simple method that we used uh, in the past. Is it still applicable till now or not? No. The last point about the use of uh, these drugs, the DARA and the cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, edexa, etc. If there is any um, histopathological study that studied the impact of using these drugs, I mean pre and post treatment, to see if, if there is any histopathological improvement or this is just stabilization and a rest of the disease um, um, and uh, preventing uh, further deposition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayman, for sharing your uh, great experience with the transplant and amyloid in general.
I'm not aware about study that uh, has that, honestly. Uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Wissam is aware uh, that the biopsied people. Uh, I, we are still learning about it. Uh, for example, we have data, you know, for two years, but we are looking forward for the long-term outcome for those people. But I am not honestly aware about patients who re biopsied uh, after uh, receiving the that regimen. I have Dr. to Tari, if you would allow to comment. Uh, was him, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, if, if you just allow uh, allow uh, um, a small comment to the last point uh, of mm -hmm. Professor Aymar um, uh, there is a major difference between the, uh, the lines of management that suppresses further production, like the DARA and the portuzumib, uh, as well as the cyclophosphamide and steroids, with other lines of treatment that cleaves the already present amyloid fibril. So, I mean, with all these treatment, uh, the, the, and you will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to the already deposited amyloid fibrils, it's not a, a, a dissolving of those fibrils. It's just um, a trial to uh, limit further production. Is that okay? Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. But we did we did have the different... Would you comment on that? I can't think. Yes, yes, I'm commenting, Ahmed. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. There are main lines or uh, targeted treatments. To uh, The target is to stop the progression and new deposits of amyloidosis. But there had also been trials now for years going on. Uh, some of them um, but I did reach clinical uh, phase uh, three, but they, didn't, they were not FDA approved uh, yet which actually targets the lysis of the um, amyloid deposits. But uh, what I want to comment on that... Yeah, yes, I know about that. You cannot, but... you cannot really judge from a pre- and post-biopsy. You always tend to forget that most renal diseases are actually mm. patchy. And if, uh, if we're talking about AL amyloid, for example, and if you have um, a patient with when it's a minimal disease, and then you can be misled that it is really decreasing. And if the patient already has advanced disease, then this is advanced and you're not expecting to have a good um, a good response. So you cannot judge from a biopsy. This is very focal. You only biopsy a certain area. You can never biopsy the same area twice. This is simply unfeasible. So uh, judging on the extent of um, any disease actually progress, uh, progressing from a pre or a post uh, biopsy is something which is really difficult. And there is also another point, but this comes from um, my own experience when uh, with the uh, interleukin uh, anti-interleukin-6 and one in amyloid A, and uh, we've tried the biopsy sequence uh, with the a original biopsy with the diagnosis of the patients and a, a biopsy while the patients were actually on uh, the anti-interleukins. And although the patients have uh, shown um, a very surprisingly clinical improvement in the uh, level of proteinuria and with the, with the renal functions where they have uh, decreased, uh, the amyloid deposits were extensive in the kidney. And I don't have any explanation for this. So it seems that was something which is related more to um, cytokines and inflammatory mediators like amyloid A, that you can have a discrepancy that there is a part of the clinical uh, response which is related to controlling these cytokines and, and interleukins rather than the presence of the amyloid deposits itself. And you cannot apply this to other type of amyloidosis like AL, for example, because again, this is a different story. Uh, whether if you can control the burden of the kappa and lambda by um, by the targeted treatment, whether this also is going to improve the GFR of the kidney, this is also a possibility. I think this is mainly what what happens. So we still, as Tori said, we, we there are still some dark areas that we don't know about uh, the patient's response. So this is just comes from our uh, clinical experience. And no, the potassium... Okay, the total, would you comment on that anymore. point? Excuse me? Would you like yes, to comment? Yes, the total, would you comment on the, on, on, on the um, um, main, main uh, divisions in the lines of management 
and whether you've already started uh, any therapeutic trial for the lysis of the already present uh, amyloid fibril in the tissues and whether you had any clinical follow-up for this? So, uh, you know, the, the trial that I'm aware of about the KL101, and that's the that I mentioned, this is a monoclonal antibody directed against the deposits. Uh, that's just, the results that I know is a uh, phase two study, so certainly not enough to, you know, to, to have a meaningful, uh, 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 you know, like therapy line. But yes, uh, people who received the, the KL101, they had good renal response, but they didn't receive it alone in that study. They had also plasma cell directed therapy. So I am not sure if the deposits improved by itself. You know, we need a randomized trial really to, you know, to prove that if the if the medications that will cause lysis on the of the deposits will improve the renal outcome or no. Again, the, the side effect profile was low. So it's reasonable to add them. However, whether they are really effective or no, uh, there is no data so far. Uh, there is a phase three trial now, but ongoing on patients who have cardiac 3A and 3B. Of course, there are some renal patients out of those. So we'll see what, what is the overall outcome for those down the road. Uh, that's all, all what I know about it, honestly. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hussam and Dr. Tariq. We have some questions from the chat and many, many questions from uh, Professor Hussam al uh, He will comment yes. on them uh, by himself. But maybe before we can uh, take two questions from uh, Dr. Amal, uh, she said that uh, theoretically a localized renal amyloidosis, I think both questions are Dr. Tariq. Uh, localized renal amyloidosis, would you say it wise to do a nephrectomy? In, to reduce peritoneuria, especially in AA amyloidosis. And the second question is from Dr. Diana Charles. Is there is any strong evidence for management of cardiac amyloidosis transitrine with TAA, FA, MI, EIS? Tefamidus? Okay. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So so first question, I think if the if the patient has proteinuria and amylo AA amyloid, I think it's it's it will not be considered localized. We are talking about production of serum AA with deposition on the kidney and proteinuria. Uh, and please correct me if I if I understand that wrong. So if the if if the kidney if there is already proteinuria, then this is not localized amyloid. Yes. Uh, yeah. So again, if uh, I might understood the question in a different way, so please correct me. I think me. she means I she think... means that if it's only in the kidney, this is what. It's only in the kidney localized in the kidney for, uh, with proteinuria. Ah, so she not localized, it. not localized amyloid. No, okay, no, not, not localized, localized. amyloid. Ah, okay. She means. I, I, oh. I honestly, I, 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 I'm not aware of that. Will be effective. I, I myself don't have a lot of ex or hands-on experience in AA because it's not common here. Uh, you know, during my years here in different places, I only saw three cases. Uh, and uh, I think the the main problem is finding the cause behind it. So. Uh, I'm not sure about nephrectomy as a as a radical solution for that. And uh, please, if anyone has uh, more experience on this, you know, uh, uh, need to learn. If you yeah. allow me, uh, Doctor Tar, uh, I I would like to share a piece of information about uh, that people used to think that A amyloidosis is an exclusive in our region for FMF, and this is not true. And the, the other point is, it's not only as well uh, just a, a chronic inflammatory or chronic infective as previously taught in the undergrad uh, teaching. It, it, there is some genetic form of AA amyloidosis as well, which is not FMF by default, and it's definitely not related to um, the, and these are the, the hurdle in the management because they they do not respond to colchicine therapy. Uh, you might need to give interleukin-1 or interleukin-6 inhibitors, and they are a part of the AID or the auto-inflammatory uh, diseases that are genetically uh, inherited in, in those type of patients. And not all of these are amyloidogenic in type, but there are some hereditary AA amyloidosis 
and have been reported in a few uh, literature as well. If I might so add, this is, this is the main, yeah, 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 this is the main reason. Uh, this is the main reason why we stopped calling it the secondary form of amyloidosis because it's not secondary to anything, and we see it in children who yes. are five years and six years old who has absolutely no inflammatory diseases. So uh, it's just an amyloid A. It's not a secondary form of amyloidosis anymore. And in a lot of cases, you simply cannot identify what's the underlying uh, problem. However, they do seem to respond to some forms of them, especially if they are under the umbrella of AID uh, to, uh, to anti-interleukin uh, treatments. Yeah, and the other thing is they, they are not uh, renal uh, limited amyloidosis. Uh, and the, the previous notion that they do not involve the heart um, in, the, in the main is not any more valid. The, we've seen many of these patients with cardiac amyloidosis and they turned out to be AA amyloidosis. And I think some are involved in, in such a project that's looking for those type of patients. Yes. Correct me in this point. Yes, yes. Yes, we are. We do see it's not as common as AL, or let me put it this way, it's not the presenting uh, feature of uh, of this disease. So AL can um can be only cardiac, can present first by cardiac, then renal, can then be or can then be renal and then cardiac. So it's a major uh, organ involvement in AL amyloidosis. But in AA amyloidosis, it's definitely a, a, a complication in a good percentage of, uh, of patients. And as Ahmed have mentioned, you never have only renal uh, amyloid A deposits. So these patients can have skin subcutaneous deposits, which are not, uh, not symptomatizing, has absolutely no symptoms. Mm -hmm. So you don't know whether it's only uh, renal or not. And... Um, so, and I have never heard of an effect to me to decrease also the dose of uh, proteinuria. I, I think uh, Dr. Amel uh, uh, wants to, to point out to the, to the effect to me for resistant nephrotic syndrome that have been mentioned in the literature, whether medical or uh, surgical nephrectomy in resistant nephrotic syndrome. But the issue with uh, amyloidosis, whether AA or definitely not in AL cases, even with other type of amyloidosis, that is not only the kidney usually that is affected. Even if we think that it is renal limited, we usually have some other forms of um, uh, amyloid deposits that might not be clinically apparent on this specific situation, but will appear later. Uh, yes, this is, I think this is question, the question about the protein, uh, nephrectomy with severe proteinuria. Dr. Ahmed, uh, I, I was out for connection for some time. So I think the question of uh, Dr. Diana Charles, you can, if you can read about uh, the use of cathamidas uh, in the cardiac amyloidosis. That's yeah, uh, 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 yes, the yes. professor yes. Was, was, yes, yes, professor Tai was going to comment on that as well, please. Okay, if you go ahead, okay. Dr. Tai. Yeah, the, yes, there is evidence, yes. Uh, there is a study, I think, was published in New England in 2018 or 2019 about uh, the, the, the mortality benefit and uh, uh, symptom improvement for uh, uh, ATTR patients with cardiac involvement, and it made it to be FDA approved. Uh, so yeah, there is evidence for using that pill. Now, what's what's ongoing are studies on the other uh, medication, which is the gene silencer, the patisiran, uh, which was approved for uh, uh, amyloid with uh, neurological involvement. However, still, it didn't make it for uh, cardiac involvement yet. There are ongoing studies, and we are waiting to see if it will be approved. They give it to people who probably failed the famidus, but... Uh, but so far, uh, uh, Tefamidus is the only uh, approved for cardiac uh, ATTR amyloid. Thank you. Thank you. For thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and for this point, Dr. Tai, uh, just, just a, a point uh, of practice to ask, uh, you still um, give Tefamidus in the States uh, based on uh, the diagnosis of ATTR without a, a tissue biopsy? As you've mentioned earlier, yes. Uh, if uh, again, uh, if those patients are presenting with uh, 
uh, classical criteria classical criteria and they have the P positive pyp scan which is very sensitive and specific for attr and no monoclonal gammopathy because uh, you know the attr especially the the wild type is common uh, in elderly when the monoclonal gammopathy is common as well so we might run to a scenario where uh, we need a biopsy because of monoclonal gammopathy. Uh, however, if the, the PYP scan is positive uh, and uh, no other features of AL amyloid, including the lab abnormalities, then uh, they go forward and prescribe uh, the families. Thank you for okay. the question. Yeah, thank you. Professor Hisham Said, please. Thank you very much. It, uh, I have spent two hours of enjoyment, really. And uh, I will be very shortly. I would like to thank us all for this very enjoyable talk and very comprehensive from all. I have a lot of comments and questions, but for the sake of the time, I will be just texting uh, what comments. Questions. In the chat. <laughs> yes, I have a lot. Of, <laughs> I, I, I always uh, <laughs> writing here. Yeah. Please yeah, so, <laughs> so I will summarize because it's uh, a couple of hours. Uh, yes. 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 Just a couple of minutes. I fully agree with Professor Wissam in the deposition stages of uh, any molecules. The native molecules alone does not explain how much it is deposited. For example, if we take in the uh, beta 2 microglobulin deposition, the native molecule cannot be deposited except by glycation, then cytokines, involvement just for synovial uh, membrane invasion. The same are uh, equal in any molecule that the deposition criteria, according to the blood level, does not uh, usually correlate directly to the disease activity. For the uh, Professor Tari, he mentioned that on dialysis from 1960, no. Nowadays, with hemodial filtration and superflux, our results from Encham University show that we can get a 50% reduction in the kappa and lambda uh, ratio using hemodial filtration with superflux in our studies. And these patients typically improve even in patients with myeloma and cast disease with AKI. So we can remove uh, as much as we can from kappa and lambda right now, and the patients are doing one. My question for Professor uh, uh, Wissam, uh, just I wonder from your experience, how many of the biopsies showed that uh, amyloid uh, L and amyloid A deposition on the prevalence of your biopsy? Because I wonder that if I can diagnose the patient with uh, uh, myeloma or monoclonal gammopathy or any of that of free light chain, why I go to biopsy even if the uh, clinical and laboratory findings are highlighting one of uh, such a deeds. So how many in your uh, experience AA to AL biopsy findings? Well, in our own uh, cohort of patients, which are around um, more than 700 uh, amyloid biopsies, we have a prevalence of around 57% uh, 50, um, of amyloid A, and we have around 37% of AL. So this is the, uh, it's equivalent to, um, uh, almost equivalent to LECT. Uh, one is 34, one is 37. So let's say around 30%. So it is the second common type that we see. Um, it's not rare, definitely. And um, it's not that uh, uncommon. So we Yes, I understand. Support. It's not, yes. it's a very, un yes, it's, a, yeah. We, we saw every day and, so let, us, yeah, let us discuss that if you have a positive immunofixation for a patient yes. and have a kappa and lambda ratio, why would you need a renal biopsy? If you, exactly. have a, you have, if you have a serology with this, then you have a monoclonal gammopathy. And you need to know whether this monoclonal gammopathy has a significance or not. First, you need to know what pattern of disease this monoclonal gammopathy have in the kidney, because as we all know, they have different prognosis. 
and their prognosis is more uh, essential in the in the line of management which could be chosen. So patients with light chain cost nephropathy can be reversible and can retain good function. So they have a better chance at the bortezomib and they have a better chance for a transplant if they are eligible for a BMT. Patients with their MIDD have a very poor prognosis and a very high recurrence rate post-transplant, which is not applicable for light chain cost nephropathy. Patients with amyloidosis, even they do worse. So if you have a monoclonal gammopathy and you know that the renal affection is due to the monoclonal gammopathy, you still need to know which type of renal affection do you have, because then this will dictate the line of management hematological wise, these patients are going to have and their prognosis and the recurrence post-transplant. Number two, if you have amyloidosis in the kidney and you have a positive immunoprotection and kappa and lambda ratio, that does not mean that the amyloid you have is AL amyloid. We have seen uh, frequently patients who has, uh, especially in Egyptians, that who has lacked amyloidosis and they have uh, light chain cost nephropathy. Patients who has AL amyloid and lacked amyloid in the same kidney. Patients who has, again, MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy and they have amyloid A in their kidneys. So um, you cannot just have a positive immunofixation and kappa and lambda ratio and a biopsy positive for amyloidosis and say that this patient has AL amyloid because the treatment, as we have been discussing, for AL amyloid is you give patients chemotherapy. So this is a serious treatment with serious side effects. So we need to be sure which type of amyloid we're targeting. So no, you cannot, this is not accepted in uh, in clinical practice nowadays that we just have a monoclonal gammopathy on serology and then consider it. Uh, and then I, th I think in yeah. clinical practice, we are not, uh, uh, many uh, are not going to do biopsy. In clinical practice, if the patient diagnosed as monoclonal gammopathy, whatever the cause. I For that I reason, we uh, refer the patient to a hematologist and do pomar biopsy. And uh, typically they start a lot of the pomar and they started their chemotherapy and we'll follow up the That's renal that. profile. Uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Hisham, uh, uh, if, I would, uh, if I would interfere here, uh, yes. uh, I think we have to di differentiate between two different scenarios. Yes. If the patient is diagnosed as a monoclonal gammopathy without significant renal involvement for a reason or another, without uh, heavy proteinuria, without uh, renal impairment, you might uh, defer the biopsy or if the patient responded well to hydration and probably he was diagnosed as simple cast nephropathy with no proteinuria and so on, you might start the treatment as an AKI associated with cast that resolved or with hypercalcemia that resolved and you might defer the biopsy. But definitely if the patient is, is having unresolving renal impairment or having significant proteinuria, uh, he should be biopsied. And I would like to remind you, Sam, with a patient that we've uh, recently uh, investigated uh, who was pro uh, proven to be um, 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 multiple myeloma with a full brown picture and with the bone marrow as well. And he turned to be minimal change. I, and I would like to, to have a comment about this because uh, he, 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 you know, uh, I don't think whether the EM is, is uh, out yet or not. But uh, it was totally normal on the light and immuno, as you reported. Minimal change so, is, yeah, could happen anywhere and any for anyone. But uh, yeah, yes, but, uh, it's a, it's a rare case. You have a, a rare case of that this, for sure. No, but this proof is even if it's not as I said, monoclonal gammopathies have variable. Uh, yes, presentation. But I, I need to change my practice. I I see myeloma every day. Uh, every other day in practice common, and you need to know what's going on with this kidney and what's even but, amazing is but that patient... to some, uh, if you if you allow me that uh, we received patients with usually we have a ckd of uh, mild uh, decreased the gfr and the anemia which is not explained by his uh, lower gfr and we test for uh, protein electrophoresis immunofixation and once we found that the patient has any kind of myeloma or free light chain disease, we refer to hematologist and we don't go directly and we defer the renal biopsy as Ahmed say, just for 
unrecoverable acute kidney injury or unexplained deterioration of renal function, although the myeloma had been controlled. But it's difficult for a, a nephrologist to do a renal biopsy immediately for a patient who needs hematological treatment first. Uh, this is my concept. Of course, oh. there's a concern for the complications, especially in myeloma. Yes. Who tend to have uh, a bleeding. To, uh, so I will not try to renal biopsy directly to a patient who has a myeloma. I have to treat myeloma and follow up a renal profile. Professor, Professor Ishan? Yes. Yes. Uh, we have still uh, many questions and uh, some comments on the chat. Please, from Professor. Professor Ishan? Yes, I'm here. So yes. that's uh, this yes, is yes, the yes. Main, main, main concern about that, uh, and so, I finished uh, my uh, my comment and question. And would like to thank you again for all this uh, very illuminating uh, talk tonight. Thank you for thank your you. Thank you. Thank you. and for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, uh, Dr. Ahmed, please uh, correct me if I am wrong. Uh, I have a question from uh, one of our attendees about. Uh, I think it is Dr. Tari about the use of steroids and worsening of the case. He's uh, asking about his clinical experience in giving steroids uh, and the result in worsening of the case. Uh, well, have, have a, do you have a comment, Dr. Tari? Uh, you mean like steroids alone or steroids? I with... use steroids, yes. I think Dr. Ahmed, please write the question, the question again. Read the question again, sorry. Uh, high dose steroids resulted in clinical worsening of the case. You mean like wow. AL patient, AL amyloid patient? He didn't received... specify. He didn't okay. specify in his question. Do you have yeah. an experience with something like this? I, I would say, you know, uh, the steroid alone is not the therapy. Uh, maybe history, yes, before, if we're talking about AL, uh, it's part of the therapy. And I'm sure down the road, they want to spare even the steroids. So uh, I think uh, if we're talking about high dose steroid, it will it will be associated with uh, some sort of bone marrow uh, directed therapy. And if the patient didn't respond or got worse, then we should switch the line of treatment. M you know, if if that's the scenario that we are talking about, but yeah. steroid alone will not be enough for treating the, the plasma cell disorder. Okay, thank you for this. Thank you. Uh, com uh, a comment from uh, Professor Faisal Shaheen, the past president of Saudi. Uh, kidney and transplantation disease and past president of Middle East Society of, of Organ Transplantation. Please, Professor Faisal. Thank you. Yes, I enjoyed the discussion and I, I enjoyed the talk. It is important, uh, a very important, uh, uh, you know, subject which we are facing all the time. And as it's mentioned by some of you, the hematologists sometimes take the case and never show up show up to us except uh, after reaching the dialysis. So again, uh, it's very important. I like the discussion and uh, it was very well presented. And uh, I actually learned a lot uh, tonight. Thank you very much. Nothing to be added. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Dr. Faisal. Thank you, Professor Thank you, Faisal. Uh, another question from uh, Dr. Mohammed Abdelbari, uh, the head of nephrology department in military hospital, Alexandria about uh, uh, treatment of amyloid lect, your experience in treatment of amyloid lect. For me, I have a case of rapid progression of amyloid lect, I think for, to end the stage renal disease for about uh, less than one year. So uh, your opinion in treatment of such a condition? Uh, thank you, Dr. Yasser. Very good question. Uh, uh, as of now, I, I don't think there is uh, a proven therapy for uh, the lect. Uh, it's certainly the number of cases are increasing. I myself didn't encounter a case, but so far, just reviewing the literature, there is no therapy for the lect. Uh, hopefully, something will evolve in the future. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think there is a good therapy for that disease right now. Okay, thank you. I think for the prevalence, we Sam commented about this, and if you want to add uh, something about the prevalence, we Sam. Uh, yeah, I have added that we're seeing more and more cases from Egyptian patients, and it seems a very prevalent disease among Egyptians, so we really need to be uh, more aware of it and uh, uh, suspicious uh, for it. And as uh, Dr. Tariq mentioned, uh, no, unfortunately, so far, 
there hasn't been a specific treatment, but there are several parties who are interested in um, in finding a treatment for it. So hopefully we can, um, there could be a treatment available um, within the coming years. Uh, last comment, uh, hopefully. We have a treatment with Sam. Last comment from uh, Professor Said Khamis, head of nephrology department, Menofeya University. Please, Professor Said. Uh, thank you, Professor Yasser, and thank you for all the great professors and uh, the uh, uh, great discussion. Uh, I have two questions, if you allow me. Number one, uh, uh, if a patient uh, with FMF developed uh, endostational disease secondary to what's called uh, AA amyloidosis, uh, usually we use this colchicine for such a patient, but if the patient already started dialysis, uh, should we continue with this uh, potentially uh, neuro uh, myotoxic, as Professor Ayman said, medication like this colchicine, even in a small dose, to protect uh, the other non-renal organs like heart and so? That's uh, question number one. Uh, second question is, uh, it seems to be an odd question a little bit regarding what's called iatrogenic amyloidosis, either by illicit or non-illicit medications. And in the meantime, what are the medications contraindicated in a patient with cardiac amyloidosis? Uh, I, I mean, especially the cardiac amyloidosis, like the cardio inhibitory uh, or digoxin or so on. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Said Hamis, for um, uh, for your questions. Uh, so the first question, I really don't know. I'm not sure uh, if continuing the colchicine will be uh, will add uh, extra benefit uh, down the road. I again, I, I'm 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 not sure. Maybe if the patient is will be considered for kidney transplant in the future, it makes sense to continue. But again, I'm not really sure about. If the I may, uh, of that if question. I may comment on this yes. one. Yes. Uh, the fact that the patient have reached end stage renal disease is um is a proof of failure for colchicine uh, treatment that the colchicine did not control uh the amyloid deposits. So usually uh patients with amyloid A are started on colchicine and if they were resistant to colchicine treatment, then you move to the uh, antilucans. Uh, like the anarchina and so on. And um, post-transplant, uh, these patients also are uh, put on these uh, treatments to try to control uh, recurrence. Although um, in the literature, there are small uh, patients cohorts as, and they, are, they specifically come from FMF patients or a series of FMF patients. And um, the results which have been published in the literature were not really um, very promising. So we still need a larger uh, studies involving also other amyloid A patients who are not FMF and maybe uh, patients with different uh, underlying etiologies could have different responses. But so far, if a patient is on colchicine and got end-stage renal disease, then he is colchicine resistant and needs another line of therapy. Yes, uh, thank you uh, for the point. Me. And, uh, if, if you allow me. Add... Okay. Yeah, yeah, please, mm -hmm. Ayman, if, if I only would add to this point that uh, whenever we, because we, we, we usually miss to do that, which is a, an important practice point, when you put a patient on colchicine for an FMF proven, you have to repeat checking for amyloid A and CRB in the serum. Both, the control of both together to the negative phase or to the lowest possible phase would be a good signal of responding, not to wait for the occurrence of amyloidosis in the tissue and the appearance of clinical syndromes. So if the patient have a persistent high level of serum amyloid A or a positive CRB most of the time, in spite of being on high dose of colchicine, and you might raise the dose of colchicine, to higher level that we what we used to you to use actually you might go up to three grams per day or more, three milligrams per day or more. If if he is not responding, it is the time to uh, use uh, anakinra or other interleukin uh, inhibitors. Uh, as for the elective, you remember with him with uh, Kenar Javri was um, um, emailing us about the using of interleukin ten. Uh, in a yes. trial of those patients with ALECT, which is, of course, off-label use, but uh, it, it might prove to be a positive result 
and we're waiting for the, for his case uh, to, to find out what's going on. Yeah. Thank you. If you Professor allow Professor me. Um, Professor Ayman uh, Rifai. Yes. Colchicine uh, 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 is a very, very effective treatment that should be continued post-transplant. It's not only for prevention of recurrence, but for prevention of the attacks because what's causing the amyloid AA protein is, as you know, that serum the amyloid A is a phase, acute phase reactant, which is increased if uh, the uh, with, with the attacks, and this amyloid A protein is processed by macrophages to form the uh, uh, the amyloid AA protein. So uh, we have to prevent uh, and control the attacks post transplant by adequate dose of uh, colchicine. Minimum 1.5 milligram may reach 3 milligram, as Professor Ahmed said, if the patient tolerating uh, with, with no diarrhea. So still, colchicine is a cornerstone in both transplant cases with amyloidosis secondary to FMF. And cases who developed recurrence uh, in our series or in the literature those who was not on uh, was not compliant or on insufficient dose uh, with uh, for uh, colchicine, so still it's valid for hemodialysis. We may keep the patient on a small dose, five milligram, point uh, five milligram per day uh, for other uh, organs. But post transplant, we have to from day zero to start colchicine and keep it. Definitely. Thank you, Professor Ayman. Thank you. And thank you, team, Dr. Ahmed, Professor Ahmed. I think we are to close now. We are uh, two hours, and this is one of our longest meetings. And we have no more comments and no more chats. Please, Professor Ahmed. Okay, it was a real great pleasure to have you both tonight, uh, Professor Tar and Professor Sam, and with all the great discussions from Professor Hisham, Professor Ayman Ritai and Professor Said Khamis and yourself, Professor Yasser, for the very nice introduction and moderation as well. And uh, hopefully that everyone uh, did uh, get the uh, fatty meal of tonight and hopefully that uh, would have a very nice meeting in the upcoming uh, sessions. And I think we, we should go more with the rest of the AIDs because we, we've been seeing more and more of these uh, patients uh, nowadays, the auto-inflammatory disorders and how to manage. And again, uh, uh, shedding light on the new uh, treatment uh, that possibly can help in uh, the management of such a resistant uh, disease. Thanks, everyone, and bon nuit. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you, Professor you. Ahmed. Thank you, Thank you, you Tariq. Thank, Thank you very for much. This, for this highly illustrative talk. Thank you, Sam. As thank usual, you. very comprehensive. Thank you, thank you very much, Tar. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Tar. And thank you very much, Professor Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayman. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All professors who commented, who commented and shared in this session. Professor Ayman Rafai, Professor Saeed Khamis, Professor Hisham Sayed, and Professor Faisal Shaheed. Thank you, Dr. Mu'tasim Sayed. And excuse me to close to announce about the second session which will be uh, updated management of uh, chronic kidney disease by Professor Kamal Okasha. Next one is day, inshallah, 9 p.m. Cairo time. Asmaha ala khiru. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.